Right now at six, the original span turns 107 this week. Now the nation's top transportation official gives a replacement a thumbs up. It is going to be an engineering feat, uh, but clearly the, the states are ready to make that happen. So who's going to fill the gap in funding? Plus, restaurant owners in one Portland neighborhood frustrated by repeated break-ins plead for help from the city. But it's still $1,200 every single time. You know, the door, 3000 you know. And later, the family business closing its doors after more than a century. Sad. It'll be missed. It's just been an institution forever. Good evening, everyone. A day after the U.S. Transportation Secretary's exclusive sit down with KGW and PDX, Pete Buttigieg made his way today to the other big infrastructure project in the Portland Metro, the aging Interstate Bridge. Thanks so much for joining us at six. I'm David Molko and I'm Trina Green. For years, plans have been underway to replace the I-5 bridge and an infusion of federal funding is moving the project forward. Thomas Schultz joins us live. Thomas, what did Secretary Buttigieg say today? Yeah, well, guys, after the federal government approved $600 million to help replace this bridge, Buttigieg says he agrees with that decision, and he says he's been working closely on that goal with state leaders from both sides of the river. But it clearly needs to be replaced. From Oregon to Washington to D.C., everyone agrees. It's time to replace the I-5 bridge, a link across the Columbia River connecting Portland to Vancouver for more than 100 years. This is a big deal. I mean, this bridge is about to turn 107 years old. And that could mean big changes on the way. What about the proposal for the new bridge excites you most? Well, uh, you know, for one thing, and it sounds simple, but uh, no moving parts. Say goodbye to the drawbridge, which boats pass underneath. Instead, the new bridge would be higher, accommodating boats, though low enough to not interfere with planes. That's not an easy thing, so it is going to be an engineering feat. And recently, the project moved forward. In December, the Department of Transportation approved $600 million for a new bridge. Big money, but a drop in the bucket for a project expected to cost around $6 billion. Already, Oregon and Washington have pledged more than $2 billion, and tolls should pay for a big chunk, too still leaving around $2 billion needed from D.C. I would be shocked if we did not get more applications for more funding to get this done. Though this isn't the first time someone tried to replace the bridge. You know, we've been waiting 10 years to start. And so every day is precious. We want to put pedal to the metal. More than a decade ago, a plan called the Columbia River Crossing failed after the state of Washington didn't approve $450 million in funding, largely based on objections to include light rail. Though this time, Governor Jay Inslee says it'll be different. I feel we've really got momentum. There is a plan on both sides of the river. And over on the other side of the river, Oregon's leader says this plan would lead to big improvements. This is the type of facility we need to see for the future, and this is what we need for our climate goals, right? With light rail and pedestrian pathways aligning with goals to lessen traffic and create a climate-friendly bridge. Though with plans to break ground just two years away and completion expected in 2033, deadlines are approaching. The project right now is expected to be wrapped up around the time the bridge is 114, 115 years old. How imperative is it to work efficiently to get this new bridge going? You know, this is an ambitious project with an ambitious timeline, and it is going to take a lot of work to stay on that timeline. Part of what makes that possible is funding. We have Thomas Schultz with us now. So, Thomas, they hope to break ground in two years, but a lot of things need to line up in the meantime. So what's the next step? Well, China, the biggest thing is they still need about $2 billion in funding. Now they're hoping that two federal grants are going to help them reach that goal. It's unclear right now when those two grants will be announced, so we do expect one to come in the near future. Of course, we'll keep you updated when that does happen. Guys? Thomas, thank you. Well, speaking of transportation and safety, in the wake of the Alaska door plug blowout, the NTSB is now renewing its calls to the FAA to change policies surrounding cockpit voice recorders or CVRs. Now, in the case of Alaska 1282, investigators could not listen to that audio because it had already been overwritten. 
The NTSB wants these devices to record 25 hours worth of data instead of the current standard two hours. However, the FAA is proposing that only new aircraft should have 25 hour CVRs. Federal investigators once again pushing back, saying all planes that need to carry so-called black boxes should meet this requirement and existing planes should be retrofitted. The FAA saying that's too expensive. Now, here's what Pete Buttigieg said when I asked him whether he supports the NTSB's request. Yeah, you know, FAA was already working on this before the incident with the 737 MAX uh, that, that took place in January. I think now we have one more data point on the importance of these cockpit voice report recorders, and I think that uh, adds to the urgency of updating the practice in accordance with what NTSB has put forward. Oh, when I pressed him to clarify, Buttigieg told me it's going to be up to the FAA to, to determine which planes get retrofitted first, but that he broadly supports more recording than what we have today. The NTSB says since 2018, at least 14 investigations have been hampered by inadequate CVR data. By the way, you can catch my entire exclusive with Pete Buttigieg. It's up right now for you on our KGW YouTube page. To your headlines now, Alaska Airlines flight attendants have voted to authorize a strike. Today, the union representing the workers announced more than 99% of participating members voted yes. However, this does not mean that a strike is imminent. The authorization is in case Alaska management and the flight attendants, they can't agree on a new contract. And the last time Alaska Airlines flight attendants went on strike was in 1993. Happening right now in Salem, lawmakers are hearing public testimony on a bill that would ban book bans. Yes, it is a proposal sponsors say would protect books that some want to remove from schools because of themes of race, religion, or sexual orientation. Senate Bill 1583 says that school boards or employees cannot choose or reject material if that ban would constitute discrimination. Here's some of the public testimony. They need these these, these books that will give them time to think about difficult situations, talk about social injustice, systemic racism. They're all the better for being uncomfortable sometimes. In this deepened distrust of public education, now is not the time to validate this distrust by taking away the opportunity of citizens of individual school districts to be heard. Hundreds of people also submitted written testimony. We'll have much more from that hearing and what is in this bill tonight on KGW News at 11. There's a little bit of time left to vote in tonight's special election in Washington. The top issues in Clark County include levies for the battleground, Canis and Woodland School Districts. In all three districts, voters are being asked to fund technology, health and safety improvements. Now for your vote to count, your ballot must be postmarked by today or dropped off at an approved ballot site by eight tonight. And on the Oregon coast, a necropsy team has determined how a fin whale that washed up on shore died. They say it likely succumbed to an underlying illness of some kind because the whale had no other obvious causes of death nor fatal injuries. Washed up on the beach yesterday in Warrenton near Astoria. Fin whales are rare in general. It's even rarer for one to wash up. In all of 2023, there were only three strandings on the entire West Coast. Matt? Well, our coast is looking pretty great right now. This is at Astoria. You see the sun has obviously gone down, but the sky is still generally clear. It is 48 degrees there farther south. Also clear sky at Newport waiting for some high clouds to begin to roll in. They haven't shown up yet, but they will as we go to tomorrow. And that's the leading edge of a storm system that's going to bring us a cold rain tomorrow. And east winds will be redeveloping. We've had an absence for a couple days now, but they're going to be back tomorrow. Thursday and Friday. So get ready. East County and the Gorge and the West Hills of Portland. You know where where you get the strong east winds and then heavy snow coming to the Cascades and the Gorge. So for the valleys, most likely we're going to end up with the cold rain. We're watching Thursday morning. There's potential for some wet snowflakes. Worst case scenario would be a couple of inches of snow on the valley floor. I think that's highly unlikely. Most likely it'll just be a cold rain through the day Wednesday and on Thursday, but low temperatures will be down in the mid 30s on Thursday morning. So again, we'll be watching that one closely. There is a winter storm warning up for the gorge east of Troutdale and for the entire run of the Cascades, which will see heavy snow. It'll be feet of snow, so it's going to go a long way towards improving the ski conditions and also improving our mountain snowpack too. So lots to talk about here. The valley should be fine, but we'll talk about the mountains and the gorge guys in a bit. Back to you. Thanks so much, Matt.
Tonight, Oregon is reporting the first recorded human case of bubonic plague in the state in more than eight years. And health officials say the person infected in central Oregon likely got it from their cat. <laughs> Catherine Cook has more from the newsroom. A Deschutes County health officer says the pet owner is alive and has responded very well to treatment. Sadly, the cat did not survive. This is the first human case of the bubonic plague to hit Oregon since 2015. Health officials say the disease was detected in its early stages and the case poses little risk to the community. The county says no other cases have been reported. Pets can get bubonic plague from infected rodents or fleas and can then transfer the infection to humans. Deschutes County Health Services says treating pets for fleas can help prevent that. You should also avoid contact with rodents and don't feed animals like squirrels or chipmunks. Early treatment is also key. Nowadays, we can use flea treatment for animals. We have antibiotics, the same antibiotics that we have for animals that we can treat them with. So a huge success rate, right? And for humans, it's the same thing. We have antibiotics that will treat individuals and prevent an infection right away. But you need to do those prevention components to make sure that you're not exposed and your animal is not exposed. Those infected with the plague will typically see symptoms within two to eight days of exposure. That can include fever, nausea, muscle aches, and very swollen lymph nodes. Cases of the plague are very rare in the U.S. According to the CDC, an average of seven human cases are reported each year, the majority bubonic. Back to you. Yeah, really interesting there. All right, this evening we're taking a look at an addiction recovery center in Newburgh, funded in part by Measure 110. It's marking one year since it opened. The addiction crisis isn't limited to just downtown Portland. It's hitting other parts of the state very hard, where resources are even more limited. Recovery Works Northwest provides a place for people to go after detox to get ongoing care like therapy and medicine. It costs just over $1 million to open with money coming from Measure 110. That's the voter-approved initiative that decriminalized public public use of hard drugs and put cannabis tax dollars toward opening centers like this one. They've helped more than 400 people this year. Um, so I started using fentanyl about two years ago, got heavily into it, became homeless, lost my job, and they've helped us completely turn it around. I tried a few times and they welcome me back every time, even if I failed previously. Meanwhile, the state is talking about reversing parts of Measure 110 and recriminalizing possessions of hard drugs. Recovery Works Northwest argue this is not a long-term solution. They say it criminalizes addiction and forces people into recovery when they are not ready, putting them at greater risk.